Hare Krishna, well raises have been and Roger here. It is study time. We're gonna read chapter one of the Bhagavad Gita. And this time Roger's gonna read alone. Uh, in chapter two, I'll start reading Arjun and Roger Krishna. Yeah, so so excited for this. We are finally diving into the Bhagavad Gita together. Um, so I just want to stress the importance of chapter one. I know some people think that chapter one can be skipped and it's not essential and it's not necessary. I highly disagree because chapter one sets the whole stage mm -hmm. for the teachings and for the mm -hmm. Gita and lets you know about Arjun and what he's going through and what without truly understanding that um, then a lot of the immense teachings can be, you know, overlooked, and mm. and we may not, we may wonder why Arjun mm. is receiving such profound teachings, and how are we worthy to receive such teachings ourselves? Mm. So Arjun is kind of like a mirror for ourselves and mm. what it takes to truly understand and grasp these teachings, because there's a certain level of surrender that must happen. So, so by seeing our June's struggle we can you know mm. take it on ourselves to put ourselves in the same state to be more receptive and receptivity is key because otherwise whew, mm. it might go right over your head so we need to we need mm. to prime ourselves and put ourselves in the proper state to receive these teachings Okay, just to set the stage for what is happening in chapter one, I don't want to give too many spoilers because I'm sure we're going to react to the Mahabharat someday. Mm -hmm. oh, so, totally. yeah, so anyways, to just set the, the stage, basically they've gathered on the field of battle and it's like mm -hmm. the biggest war in history, right? So you got Arjun and Krishna on one side and Krishna mm -hmm. is the charioteer for Arjun. Yeah. I was wondering because on the pictures, like he, it looked like he was. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. So Krishna. Wow. <laughs> so, okay. so here's a little bit of a spoiler, but Krishna said that he won't take part in the fighting, but he will drive Arjun's chariot for him. Oh, wow. Because, of course, if Krishna oh, fought, God. then that would be it, right? Oh, so, wow. Okay. okay. Yeah. So cool. he, just imagine. So yep. so God is driving your chariot, right? <laughs> wow. That's special. Okay. Yeah. So they've gathered on the field of battle, and that's what's okay. happening, right? Okay. All right. So here we go. So Dhritarashtra said, Sanjaya gathered on the holy land of Kurukshetra, eager to fight. What did my sons and the sons of Pandu do? Right, so Dhritarashtra is the king on the other side, but he's blind, so he's not taking part in the fighting. So it's his mm -hmm. sons, and he has a hundred sons, and they're the ones, yeah, on the other side. Okay. And uh, so anyways, he took over, he kind of took over the kingdom, and the Pandavas, which is Arjuna and his four brothers, I think there's five of them, um, yeah, they're on the opposite mm -hmm. side. And Sanjaya, he's like a seer, right? So he can he can see, you know, like distance mm -hmm. viewing. He's got like clairvoyance, right? So he can see and hear everything that's happening on the field of battle. And he's relaying to Dhritarashtra, you know, what's happening. So when he's asking, uh, what did my sons and the sons of Pandu do? He's talking about, of course, his sons, the Kauravas. Mm -hmm. And then the sons of Pandu, which are the Pandavas. Okay. Sanjaya said, At that time, seeing the army of the Pandavas drawn up for battle and approaching Dronacharya, King Durodhanan spoke the following words Behold, O revered master, the mighty army of the sons of Pandu, arrayed for battle by your talented pupil, Dristajumna, son of Drupada. There are in this army heroes wielding mighty bows and equal in military prowess to Bhima and Arjuna, Satyaki in Virata, and the Maharathi warrior chief Drupada, Dristiketu, Chikitana, and the valiant king of Kasi, and Purujit, Kuntiboja, and Sabia, the best of men, and mighty Yudamanyu, and valiant Utamaju, 
Abhimanyu, the son of Subhadra, and the five sons of Draupadi, all of them Maharathis, warrior chiefs. O best of Brahmanas, know them also, who are the principal warriors on your side, the generals of my army. For your information, I mention them. Yeah, so basically, so the the son of Drisharastra, yeah, he's talking to his chief, and he's talking about, they're looking at the, you know, the great army on the other side, and now he's going to talk about all the chiefs and warriors on his side, okay. right? So it's... It's really important, too, because just so we get an essence and a feel of the scope of these, you know, mighty warriors. Because mm -hmm. we got to remember, too, mm -hmm. so I like to see it as, you know, a, a time in history when there was, like, enlightened beings and more advanced, you know, souls, you know, kind of more mm -hmm. integra integrated in Dharma and the practice of spiritual pursuits so that their attainments of whatever they pursued were that much greater than what we possess now right so these are like these are like warriors like we wouldn't even can't mm -hmm. even comprehend oh, nowadays okay. right so these are just incredibly oh, incredibly wow. advanced and great men so yourself and bisma and karna and kripa who is ever victorious in battle and even so asvatama vikarna and burisrava the son of somadatta and there are many other heroes equipped with various weapons and missiles who have staked their lives for me, all skilled in warfare. This army of ours, fully protected by Bhisma, is unconquerable, while that army of theirs, guarded in everywhere by Bhima, is easy to conquer. Therefore, stationed in your respective positions on all fronts, do you all guard Bhisma, in particular on all sides. So it's showing how... Duryodhana is incredibly, you know, egotistical and confident, right? He's just sure that they're going to win, right? Mm -hmm. Even though Krishna is on the other side, right? Oh, okay. So okay. he's in another part of the backstory is that, so Krishna, so both of them went to Krishna for help, right? Oh. Yeah. And then, so Krishna gave his army to the opposing side, right? Oh. He, his whole army and Krishna was God in oh. human form at that time and everybody knew that and accepted that so he had a huge army okay right and he gave it to the opposing side but then joined Arjuna's side <sighs> as the charioteer and advisor to Arjuna I love it yeah because wow. anybody who goes to God for help he will help them right okay wow yeah mm. yeah the grand old man of the Korova race, the glorious grand patriarch Bhisma, cheering up Duryodhana, roared terribly like a lion and blew his conch. Then conches, kettle drums, tabors, drums, and trumpets suddenly blared forth, and the noise was tumultuous. So just mm. a big, so they're getting ready for battle, and they're all blowing their horns, right? I and can just hear it. getting pumped up, right? Um, mm. Then seated in a glorious chariot, drawn by white horses, Sri Krishna, as well as Arjuna, blew their celestial conches. So these are, this is a time also where there's like mystical weapons, right? And, oh. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, so celestial conches, right? So when no. I first heard that, it was like, you know, like the reverberations would have just mm. drowned out yeah. whatever the other army was blowing, right? <laughs> So they even have names, right? So Sri Krishna blew his conch named Panchajanya, Arjuna Devadatta, while Bhima of ferocious deeds blew his mighty conch Pandra, right? Wow. So their conch shells it. are named. King Yudhishthira, son of Kunti, blew his conch Anantavijaya, while Kakula and Sahadeva blew theirs, known as Sugosha and Mani Pushpaka, respectively. And the excellent archer, the king of Kashi, and Sikandi, the Maharathi, the great warrior, chariot warrior, Dristajumna and Virata, and invincible Sajaki Drupada, as well as the five sons of Draupadi, and the mighty armed Abhimanyu, son of Subhadra, all of them, O Lord of the earth, severely blew their respective conches 
from all sides. So now everybody's <sighs> joining in, right? <laughs> wow. And it's also interesting、um, too because so Kash, Kashi is Varanasi, right? Oh, so the yeah, king yeah. of because it would have been such a huge、mm-hmm. battle that all the kingdoms in India were. Taking part, I love it. So, and the terrible sound echoing through heaven and earth rent at the hearts of Dhritarashtra's army, right? So they couldn't compete with their conches. So Arjuna and Krishna is in his side. So the Pandavas' army, their conches was just more. And what's interesting too is that the armies are bigger. So Dhritarashtra is the bad guy army, supposedly、mm-hmm. is bigger. I think he has like eleven. Kingdoms, eleven armies, and Arjuna's side has seven. Right,、mm. so the bad guys have way more people.、Yeah. Now, O Lord of the Earth, seeing your sons arrayed against him, and when missiles were ready to be hurled, Arjuna, who had the figure of Hanuman on the flag of his chariot, took up his bow and then addressed the following words to Sri Krishna: "Krishna, place my chariot between the two armies." So, Hanuman. Right. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So、I、that's that. so that's the symbology of Hanuman being present during、oh, the war of Kurukshetra. Okay, right. Okay, so okay. yeah, on, on the side of Arjun, and keep it there till I have carefully observed these warriors drawn up for battle, and have seen with whom I have to engage in this fight. I shall scan the well-wishers of evil-minded Duryodhana. In this war, whoever have assembled on his side and are ready for the fight. So he wants to go into the middle to see who he's going to be facing in the battle.、Mm. Sanjaya said, "O king, thus addressed by Arjun, Sri Krishna placed the magnificent chariot between the two armies in front of Bhisma, Drona, and all the kings, and said, 'Arjun, behold these Kauravas assembled here.'" Now Arjuna saw stationed there in both the armies his uncles, grand uncles, and teachers, even great grand uncles, maternal uncles, brothers and cousins, sons and nephews, and grand nephews. Even so, friends, fathers-in-law, and well-wishers as well. Seeing all the relations present there, Arjuna was overcome with deep、mm-hmm. compassion and spoke thus in sorrow. So he's seeing relatives and friends, right, on the opposing、yeah. side.、Okay. Arjuna said, "Krishna, as I see these kingsmen arrayed for battle, my limbs give way and my mouth is getting parched. Nay, a shiver runs through my body and hairs stand on end. The bow Gandiva slips from my hand and my skin too burns all over. My mind is whirling." As it were, I can no longer hold myself steady, and Kesava, I see such omens of evil. Nor do I see any good in killing my kinsmen in battle. Krishna, I do not covet victory, nor kingdom, nor pleasures. Govinda, of what use will kingdom or luxuries or even life be to us? Those very persons for whose sake we covet the kingdom, luxuries, and pleasures, teachers, uncles, sons, and nephews. And even so, grand uncles and great grand uncles, maternal uncles, fathers-in-law, grand nephews, brothers-in-law, and other relations are here aware, arrayed on the battlefield, staking their lives and wealth. O slayer of Madhu, I do not want to kill them, even though they slay me, even for the sovereignty over the three worlds. How much the less for the kingdom here on earth? Krishna, how can we hope to be happy slaying the sons of Dhritarashtra by killing even these desperados? Sin will surely accrue to us.、Mm. Therefore, Krishna, it does not behove us to kill our relations, the son of Dhritarashtra, for how can we be happy after killing our own kinsmen?、Mm. So he's yeah, he's having a real tough time, right? Even though these people, with their mind blinded by greed. Perceive no evil in destroying their own race, and no sin in treason to friends. Why should we, not we, O Krishna, who see clearly the sin accruing from the destruction of one's family, think of desisting from committing this foul deed? Age-long family traditions disappear with the destruction of family, and virtue having been lost, vice takes hold of the entire race. 
With the preponderance of vice, Krishna, the women of the family become corrupt. And with the corruption of women, O descendant of Vrishni, there ensues an intermixture of castes. Progeny due to the promiscuity damns the destroyers of the race as well as the race itself. Deprived of the offerings of rice and water, the manes of the race also fall. So he's talking about, you know, like war is just such a big thing, right? Because so many men die, right? And then once the men die, you know, it's even the younger generation. Like if there's little boys in the family, it's like, who do they look up to? Like the men aren't part of it anymore. And then the women you know, are left to fend for themselves and they don't have a man, you know, to, you know, to take care of them and provide for them. Even at that time, it would be, you know, yeah. tragic. And then, and then it's, so, so it's kind of a, a bit of a degeneration of the whole society, but, you know, what yeah. can you do? So he's really having these doubts, like, of, you know, do I fight or not? And then, you know, by killing mm -hmm. these men, it's like, you know, it's going to be some tough times, right? Through these evils, bringing about an intermixture of caste, the age-long caste traditions and family customs of the killers of kinsmen get extinct. Krishna, we hear that men who have lost their family traditions dwell in hell for an indefinite period of time. Oh, what a pity! Though possessed of intelligence, we have set our mind on the commission of a great sin, that due to lust for throne and enjoyment, we are intent on killing our own kinsmen. It would be better for me if the sons of Dhritarashtra, armed with weapons, kill me in battle, while I am unarmed and unresisting. Sanjaya said, Arjuna, whose mind was agitated by grief on the battlefield, having spoken thus, and having cast aside his bow and arrows, sank into the hinder part of his chariot. Thus the Upanishad sung by the Lord, the science of Brahma, the scripture of yoga, the dialogue between Sri Krishna and Arjuna ends the first chapter entitled The Yoga of Dejection of Arjun. What is dejection? Just he's deflated, right? He's mm. dejected. He's in remorse. He, mm. he doesn't think he can go through with it and he's giving up. He put aside his bow and arrows and oh, he said, okay. I cannot fight. Basically, I will not fight. Oh, I love right? that. I think this is so very important to understand before yeah. diving in. And just also, yeah, to really emphasize, like to really, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. I love it. Yeah. So mm -hmm. then, uh, so the other translation I read, it ends, yeah, I, it ends like, I will not fight. And then he says, and then I think he might say it in the next chapter, but he does say, um, you know, please teach me like what should I do I'm surrendered onto you now mm. right and it's that surrender that you know allows mm. Krishna to begin you know teaching him right yeah. so yeah. and it's really neat too like when the teaching starts it's basically they're in the middle of the battlefield and it's 18 chapters the the Gita right and it's like time freezes right so Krishna and Arjuna are like frozen in time and yeah. then the big discussion happens krishna is on their side and yeah. they are the rightful kings right so everything was avoided to try to avoid this war but then it was inevitable yeah. right so that sets the stage it's like mm -hmm. what is krishna gonna say basically i love it basically it's mm -hmm. like good versus evil right yeah. and so what happens if good backs down and arjuna just gives up you know is that worse so so then, because we watched the Ramayan, right? And there was a lot of war and violence yeah. in there. And if you haven't watched that, you guys should check it out because Sabina had a real hard time with the killing and the war. And then it's like, what do we do? Like, is it better to defend people, even if it means killing others? Or is it better to be nonviolent and practice nonviolence? Mm -hmm. So it's a dilemma. And Arjun is going to, of course, get into that in here, right? Anyway, so now you get the feel for what's going on, right? Yeah, I love it. My favorite part was the blowing of the conscious. <laughs> yeah, totally. With your explanation, it's beautiful. I can, I, I'm actually in the middle of the battlefield. Like mm -hmm. It's like, oh, maybe, yeah, when we dive into chapter number two, we can set the stage again. Yeah. Just let people know, you know, this is the situation. Just imagine this gigantic 
Mm-hmm. Strange. Huge, huge, yeah, mm. battlefield with like these, yeah, incredibly, you know, powerful warriors, right, ready to fight. Anyways, thanks so much for joining us. Thank um, you. Yeah, this was great. We set the stage and then Krishna starts teaching in chapter number two. So we hope you join us because <laughs> me and Sabine are diving right in. Yeah. So thank you so, so much. Thank you. Peace. Peace. Peace.